University of Cambridge International Examinations International General Certificate of Secondary Education November Examination Series 2014 English as a Second Language Extended Tier Listening Comprehension Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the test. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the test. Teacher, please give out the question papers, and when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready, here is the test. Look at questions 1 to 6. For each question, you will hear the situation described as it is on your exam paper. You will hear each item twice. Questions 1 to 6 For questions 1 to 6, you will hear a series of short sentences. Answer each question on the line provided. Your answers should be as brief as possible. You will hear each item twice. Question 1 What surprised the friends about the new marina? This is great. When they said they were developing a marina, I thought that would just be a place for boats. Me too. But there's so much more here. And look, there's a Thai restaurant. Yes, that's unusual for a marina. There are lots of people here, and I think they're visitors, just like us, enjoying the shopping in the gift shop, lunch in the cafe, and a few treats from the bakers. Come on. What should we do first? This is great. When they said they were developing a marina, I thought that would just be a place for boats. Me too. But there's so much more here. And look, there's a Thai restaurant. Yes, that's unusual for a marina. There are lots of people here, and I think they're visitors, just like us, enjoying the shopping in the gift shop, lunch in the cafe, and a few treats from the bakers. Come on. What should we do first? Question 2. What does the vet recommend for the horse? My horse is having problems with his feet. Is he overweight? No, his weight is OK. But are you giving him extra vitamins? It's a good idea in the winter. Yes, I am. He's been having them for several weeks, but it's not helping. His feet are bad because he's kept in a field which is too wet. You need to find some dry land for him. Oh, OK, thanks. It's always best to check with a vet. My horse is having problems with his feet. Is he overweight? No, his weight is OK. But are you giving him extra vitamins? It's a good idea in the winter. Yes, I am. He's been having them for several weeks, but it's not helping. His feet are bad because he's kept in a field which is too wet. You need to find some dry land for him. Oh, OK, thanks. It's always best to check with a vet. Question 3. Which two items will the woman at the market take home? Can I have a pineapple, some light cheese and... One of those walks over there, please. My husband will pick the walk up later as I'm off to the bank. I'll pay for it now, though. OK, I'll put it to one side. How many lychees? About a kilo. And do you want them in the same bag? Can you keep the pineapple separate, please? Yes, that's fine. Is there anything else you want? A ten kilogram bag of rice, please. 
OK. As you're on your motorbike today, I'll have the rice sent round later on. Can I have a pineapple, some light cheese, and one of those woks over there, please? My husband will pick the wok up later as I'm off to the bank. I'll pay for it now, though. OK, I'll put it to one side. How many lychees? About a kilo. And do you want them in the same bag? Can you keep the pineapple separate, please? Yes, that's fine. Is there anything else you want? A ten kilogram bag of rice, please. OK. As you're on your motorbike today, I'll have the rice sent round later on. Question 4. How long is the break in the middle of the play? OK, listen please. We will be arriving at the theatre in 10 minutes. You have 20 minutes before the play starts to find your seats. There will be a 15-minute interval in between the two acts of the play. That's when you can get yourself a drink and a snack. But you must be in your seats again when the curtain goes up for Act 2. The bus will leave promptly from the car park at 4 o'clock, so don't be late. OK, enjoy the show. OK, listen please. We will be arriving at the theatre in 10 minutes. You have 20 minutes before the play starts to find your seats. There will be a 15-minute interval in between the two acts of the play. That's when you can get yourself a drink and a snack. But you must be in your seats again when the curtain goes up for Act 2. The bus will leave promptly from the car park at 4 o'clock, so don't be late. OK, enjoy the show. Question 5. What will the girl take to school? Did you see that notice on the information screen this morning? The geography department are focusing on beaches all week. What do we have to do? We need to bring in something to help make a display. Have you got anything? I've got some shells from my holiday and some coloured pebbles that would be good. But I think I'll bring in the fossil I found last summer. How about you? I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Did you see that notice on the information screen this morning? The geography department are focusing on beaches all week. What do we have to do? We need to bring in something to help make a display. Have you got anything? I've got some shells from my holiday and some coloured pebbles that would be good. But I think I'll bring in the fossil I found last summer. How about you? I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Question 6. Which two requirements does the customer have? Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. I'd like to send this package special delivery, please. Does the package contain anything valuable? No, just some family photographs and a book, that's all. So, do you want insurance? Maybe. No, it's OK, thank you. But I'd like it to get there by next Tuesday. That should be fine. Would you like a receipt? Yes, please. I might as well. It'll go by airmail today. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. I'd like to send this package special delivery, please. Does the package contain anything valuable? No. Just some family photographs and a book. That's all. So, do you want insurance? Maybe. No. It's OK, thank you. But I'd like it to get there by next Tuesday. That should be fine. Would you like a receipt? Yes, please. I might as well. It'll go by airmail today.
That is the last of questions one to six. In a moment, you will hear question seven. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 7. Listen to the following talk about how people in ancient times created large structures, and then complete the details below. You will hear the talk twice. The Temple of Angkor Wat, the Egyptian pyramids, Stonehenge, and the famous statues on Easter Island were all built without modern technology. So how did people build the temples and statues that we so admire? In some cases, all they needed was rope, very little manpower, and some very clever carving. Other construction projects required making the best of the seasons, using thousands of people, and using animals to transport materials to the construction sites. In 15th and 16th century China, ice roads were used to slide stone blocks to Beijing in order to build palaces in the Forbidden City. These roads were splashed with water to lubricate them. With hardly any friction, it was much easier to move these huge stones. Working with nature is a common theme in the techniques used by ancient people to build their monuments and temples. Here are two more of the ways in which workers in ancient times moved the huge stone pieces needed for their big engineering projects. For many generations, people have wondered how the stone statues of Easter Island were moved from the quarries to the coast. People used to think it was a miracle. Now, it seems clear that gravity and physics were involved. For some time, experts have argued about how the islanders managed to move statues carved from volcanic rock and weighing up to 80 tons. The quarries were between 10 and 12 kilometers from the statue's final resting place. One theory is that Easter Island residents used a kind of railway track to transport their statues. This consisted of two wooden rails attached by fixed cross pieces that were laid down on the ground. The workers then pushed each statue along the track to the display area. Another theory, however, suggests the statues were actually walked to their destination. An unfinished statue could have been rocked from side to side as it tipped forward. It's similar to how one might move a refrigerator across the floor. We have seen this movement demonstrated with a five-ton replica statue, and it works. Using this method, it would have taken the islanders only a few weeks to move their statues to their resting place. Once there, Final carvings were done to finish the job. In the construction of the Temple of Angkor Wat, stone blocks were used. The quarries that provided those blocks were about 50 to 70 kilometers away in a sandstone plateau. Of the blocks used in the temple, about 90% were between 200 and 300 kilograms, and initially, Experts thought that workers in ancient times used roads to transport the stones to the city. However, recently researchers have identified canals linking Angkor to the quarries. It is much more likely, therefore, that the builders of Angkor Wat used rafts to float the blocks to the city during the rainy season, when the winds would blow favourably. In the dry season, the workers carved the blocks into the amazing structures we see today.
Now you will hear the talk again. The Temple of Angkor Wat, the Egyptian pyramids, Stonehenge, and the famous statues on Easter Island were all built without modern technology. So, how did people build the temples and statues that we so admire? In some cases, all they needed was rope, very little manpower, and some very clever carving. Other construction projects required making the best of the seasons, using thousands of people, and using animals to transport materials to the construction sites. In 15th and 16th century China, ice roads were used to slide stone blocks to Beijing in order to build palaces in the Forbidden City. These roads were splashed with water to lubricate them. With hardly any friction, it was much easier to move these huge stones. Working with nature is a common theme in the techniques used by ancient people to build their monuments and temples. Here are two more of the ways in which workers in ancient times moved the huge stone pieces needed for their big engineering projects. For many generations, people have wondered how the stone statues of Easter Island were moved from the quarries to the coast. People used to think it was a miracle. Now it seems clear that gravity and physics were involved. For some time, experts have argued about how the islanders managed to move statues carved from volcanic rock and weighing up to eighty tons. The quarries were between ten and twelve kilometers from the statue's final resting place. One theory is that Easter Island residents used a kind of railway track to transport their statues. This consisted of two wooden rails attached by fixed cross pieces that were laid down on the ground. The workers then pushed each statue along the track to the display area. Another theory, however, suggests the statues were actually walked to their destination. An unfinished statue could have been rocked from side to side as it tipped forward. It's similar to how one might move a refrigerator across the floor. We have seen this movement demonstrated with a five-ton replica statue, and it works. Using this method, it would have taken the islanders only a few weeks to move their statues to their resting place. Once there, final carvings were done to finish the job. In the construction of the Temple of Angkor Wat, stone blocks were used. The quarries that provided those blocks were about fifty to seventy kilometers away in a sandstone plateau. Of the blocks used in the temple. About ninety percent were between two hundred and three hundred kilograms, and initially, experts thought that workers in ancient times used roads to transport the stones to the city. However, recently researchers have identified canals linking Angkor to the quarries. It is much more likely, therefore, that the builders of Angkor Wat used rafts to float the blocks to the city. During the rainy season, when the winds would blow favorably, in the dry season, the workers carved the blocks into the amazing structures we see today. That is the end of question seven. In a moment, you will hear question eight. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam.
Question 8. Listen to the following interview with a man called Angus MacDonald, who works to protect birds of prey. You will hear the interview twice. Hello, I'm here today with Angus MacDonald at the Pride of Prey Bird Centre in Scotland. Angus, can you tell me about some of the work that happens here, please? OK. Here at Pride of Prey, we specialise in three areas. Education, conservation and raising young birds. I'll show you where we keep the young birds later on, but as we're here in the Information Centre, you can see the education work we do. There's a wall display over there, which was put together by a primary school after one of our officers gave a talk there. What else do you do? Well, we also work internationally. I was in France a few months ago supervising a group of volunteers to help set up an owl sanctuary. I was there for three weeks. It was great. How many people work at this centre, Angus? Is the centre open all year round? There are nine of us. Four of us are qualified climbers for the trickier assignments. The centre is open 11 months of the year, but we close for January to do some cleaning work and to get ready for the spring when we are busiest. Tell us about some of the birds you have rescued, Angus. We know the whereabouts of all of the eagles in the area. A few days ago we found a female eagle dead at the side of a road, and we knew that she had some chicks nearby. Oh. We went and found the nest on a mountainside about 2,400 metres above sea level. There were three chicks in there. It's a very rare species, so we needed to remove them quickly before they died of the very cold conditions. It was difficult to rescue the shivering and hungry chicks in the wind and rain. Do you ever hatch eggs at the centre? Yes, we put them in an incubator, where they are kept at a constant warm temperature, and in a few weeks they might hatch. And then we have baby eagles, or eaglets, which is the proper name. Do all the eggs hatch? No, we have quite a low success rate, actually. Only about 30%, which is quite disappointing. Hmm. What's your favourite bird of prey? I love working with owls. Why are they your favourite? Their feathers are beautiful, and the fact that they are soft enables them to fly in complete silence. And they can turn their heads 360 degrees. How many different types of owl are there, Angus? I think I know three. There are hundreds. Owls can be found in almost every country in the world. There are 226 different species in 170 different countries. To finish today, Angus, what's the most enjoyable part of your job? Well, I like the visits abroad and I love working outside. But releasing young birds into the wild is what I get the greatest satisfaction from. Now you will hear the interview again. Hello, I'm here today with Angus MacDonald at the Pride of Prey Bird Centre in Scotland. Angus, can you tell me about some of the work that happens here, please? OK. Here at Pride of Prey, we specialise in three areas. Education, conservation and raising young birds. I'll show you where we keep the young birds later on. But as we're here in the Information Centre, you can see the education work we do. There's a wall display over there, which was put together by a primary school after one of our officers gave a talk there. What else do you do? Well, we also work internationally. I was in France a few months ago supervising a group of volunteers to help set up an owl sanctuary. I was there for three weeks. It was great. How many people work at this centre, Angus? Is the centre open all year round? There are nine of us. Four of us are qualified climbers for the trickier assignments. The centre is open 11 months of the year, but we close for January to do some cleaning work and to get ready for the spring when we are busiest. 
Tell us about some of the birds you have rescued, Angus. We know the whereabouts of all of the eagles in the area. A few days ago, we found a female eagle dead at the side of a road, and we knew that she had some chicks nearby. Oh. We went and found the nest on a mountainside about 2,400 metres above sea level. There were three chicks in there. It's a very rare species, so we needed to remove them quickly before they died of the very cold conditions. It was difficult to rescue the shivering and hungry chicks in the wind and rain. Do you ever hatch eggs at the centre? Yes, we put them in an incubator, where they are kept at a constant warm temperature, and in a few weeks they might hatch. And then we have baby eagles, or eaglets, which is the proper name. Do all the eggs hatch? No, we have quite a low success rate, actually. Only about 30%, which is quite disappointing. Hmm. What's your favourite bird of prey? I love working with owls. Why are they your favourite? Their feathers are beautiful, and the fact that they are soft enables them to fly in complete silence. And they can turn their heads 360 degrees. How many different types of owl are there, Angus? I think I know three. There are hundreds. Owls can be found in almost every country in the world. There are 226 different species in 170 different countries. To finish today, Angus, what's the most enjoyable part of your job? Well, I like the visits abroad and I love working outside. But releasing young birds into the wild is what I get the greatest satisfaction from. That is the end of question 8. In a moment you will hear question 9. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 9. Listen to the following interview with Bernice Princey, who is a stage manager of a famous circus, and then answer the questions below. You will hear the interview twice. I'm here today at the headquarters of Cirque du Monde. The circus started in Manitoba, but is now based in Montreal. With me is Bernice Princey, a stage manager for the circus. Bernice, can you tell us something about the company? Well, more than 250 of our employees are performers doing amazing stunts because this is what the public come to see. We also have a large team of people looking after their makeup and costumes. We have lots of tours to organise and 50 people manage that aspect of the business and we have 100 safety inspectors because we regard this as our top priority. How did the circus start? It all started in 1984, when a group of street performers formed a performance troupe called the High Heels Club. I suppose this was the original name. Cirque du Monde was a later name. To raise money to start the circus, the current owner convinced his business partner to walk 56 kilometres in a clown costume. Uh -huh. Is it fair to say that the circus is really a blend of gymnastics and art? Yes, and the crucial factor that helped us succeed was that we didn't use animals that used to be associated with circuses. Instead, we focused on acrobatics in one very big tent. We have fantastic gymnasts who leap from high ropes and fly through the air as if they have wings. Nowadays, 
The merging of acrobatics with different forms of art is very common, but when we started, we were almost alone and unique with our approach and style. And I've heard that you're exploring new territories. We're very happy in Canada, but want to develop our business abroad as well. And the Chinese have a long and strong history of acrobatics, so we'll need to be on form when we put on shows out there. How does a show come about, Bernice? Well, we consult someone who can think of an idea first. Someone with experience of putting on shows in theatres, musicals maybe, or someone who just has a really great idea. People sometimes suggest using popular themes from films, but we tend not to use these. We sometimes recreate stories from ancient times, though. Once we have the core of an idea, we start rehearsing. How much does it cost to put on a show? About $18 million. And those beautiful costumes, how are they created? We take a 3D image of every performer's head and body, and every single costume is made to fit. We need a lot of costumes for each show. And those shoes are stunning. I suppose they're special shoes for acrobats. Yes, they are. All footwear is made by a shoemaker we employ on a full-time basis. He does the fittings, the manufacture and the repairs. How much practice do the performers need? We practice each show for about six months and then we go on tour. One show will run for about 18 months. We also have a residential show in Las Vegas that runs every day all year round. Well, Bernice, thank you for your time. I expect you need to go and get ready for tonight's show. Now you will hear the interview again. I'm here today at the headquarters of Cirque du Monde. The circus started in Manitoba, but is now based in Montreal. With me is Bernice Princey, a stage manager for the circus. Bernice, can you tell us something about the company? Well, more than 250 of our employees are performers doing amazing stunts, because this is what the public come to see. We also have a large team of people looking after their makeup and costumes. We have lots of tours to organise, and 50 people manage that aspect of the business. And we have a 100 safety inspectors, because we regard this as our top priority. How did the circus start? It all started in 1984, when a group of street performers formed a performance troupe called the High Heels Club. I suppose this was the original name. Cirque du Monde was a later name. To raise money to start the circus, the current owner convinced his business partner to walk 56 kilometres in a clown costume. Uh -huh. Is it fair to say that the circus is really a blend of gymnastics and art? Yes, and the crucial factor that helped us succeed was that we didn't use animals that used to be associated with circuses. Instead, we focused on acrobatics in one very big tent. We have fantastic gymnasts who leap from high ropes and fly through the air as if they have wings. Nowadays, the merging of acrobatics with different forms of art is very common, but when we started, we were almost alone and unique with our approach and style. And I've heard that you're exploring new territories. We're very happy in Canada, but want to develop our business abroad as well. And the Chinese have a long and strong history of acrobatics, so we'll need to be on form when we put on shows out there. How does a show come about, Bernice? Well, we consult someone who can think of an idea first. Someone with experience of putting on shows in theatres, musicals maybe, or someone who just has a really great idea. People sometimes suggest using popular themes from films, but we tend not to use these. 
We sometimes recreate stories from ancient times, though. Once we have the core of an idea, we start rehearsing. How much does it cost to put on a show? About eighteen million dollars. And those beautiful costumes? How are they created? We take a three D image of every performer's head and body, and every single costume is made to fit. We need a lot of costumes for each show. And those shoes are stunning. I suppose they're special shoes for acrobats. Yes, they are. All footwear is made by a shoemaker we employ on a full-time basis. He does the fittings, the manufacture, and the repairs. How much practice do the performers need? We practice each show for about six months, and then we go on tour. One show will run for about eighteen months. We also have a residential show in Las Vegas that runs every day all year round. Well, Bernie, thank you for your time. I expect you need to go and get ready for tonight's show. That is the end of question nine. In a moment, you will hear question ten. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Question 10. Listen to the following talk about the Northern Lights, and then answer the questions below. You will hear the talk twice. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you this afternoon. I'm going to talk to you about my recent trip to Lapland to see the Northern Lights. You might think that in winter, this snow-covered area of the world is a dull scene of black, grey and white, in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. On a clear night, the sky is filled with light in shades of green and blue, sometimes red or purple. I was expecting the colours, but I was not prepared for the way the lights changed and moved. In the North Pole region, the northern lights can be best seen in the winter months. The Arctic winter nights are long, so the best time to go to have a good chance of seeing the lights is between late August and early April. The skies are the clearest in March, and we had some great viewings. Time and patience are needed if you want to see the lights. They do not always make an appearance, and you may need to persist for several nights in a row to be sure of experiencing them. And standing outside in the bitter cold requires several layers of clothing. But when you do see the lights, all that effort is worthwhile. The memory of my trip will always stay with me. You can reach the area on skis or by snowmobile, but we were lucky enough to go on a sledge pulled by dogs, a much more interesting way to travel than by car. We passed swiftly across the snowy landscape until we arrived at the viewing area, a huge lake. There were about six of us, prepared to spend several hours just watching and waiting, the lake was frozen, and we were able to walk and then stand in the middle of it, with nothing to block our view as we gazed up. The trees were at least half a kilometre away. It was a cold but cloudless night, and in total silence we watched the beautiful ribbons of green light.
Now you will hear the talk again. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you this afternoon. I'm going to talk to you about my recent trip to Lapland to see the Northern Lights. You might think that in winter, this snow covered area of the world is a dull scene of black, grey, and white. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. On a clear night, the sky is filled with light in shades of green and blue, sometimes red or purple. I was expecting the colours, but I was not prepared for the way the lights changed and moved. In the North Pole region, the northern lights can be best seen in the winter months. The Arctic winter nights are long, so the best time to go to have a good chance of seeing the lights is between late August and early April. The skies are the clearest in March, and we had some great viewings. Time and patience are needed if you want to see the lights. They do not always make an appearance, and you may need to persist for several nights in a row to be sure of experiencing them. And standing outside in the bitter cold requires several layers of clothing. But when you do see the lights, all that effort is worthwhile. The memory of my trip will always stay with me. You can reach the area on skis or by snowmobile, but we were lucky enough to go on a sledge pulled by dogs, a much more interesting way to travel than by car. We passed swiftly across the snowy landscape until we arrived at the viewing area, a huge lake. There were about six of us, prepared to spend several hours just watching and waiting. The lake was frozen, and we were able to walk and then stand in the middle of it, with nothing to block our view as we gazed up. The trees were at least half a kilometre away. It was a cold but cloudless night, and in total silence we watched the beautiful ribbons of green light. That is the end of question 10, and of the test. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers. Thank you, everyone.